Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 207 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about UFO crash debris. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. For decades, people have been reporting seeing strange lights and craft in the sky. Well, a debate rages about whether these UFOs are alien craft or whether they have a purely conventional origin. As long as it's just fuzzy photos and claims about what supposed witnesses saw, many dismiss the subject out of hand. But what if we were able to get our hands on a UFO, or at least part of one? With something tangible to examine, something we could subject to laboratory testing, that could change the debate. People have reported getting materials from crashed or malfunctioning UFOs, and the government's UFO program has been studying them. So what are these materials? Where did they come from? And what have the tests revealed? So that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, where do we want to begin with today's mystery? With one of the very earliest UFO sightings, which is known as the Maury Island Incident, it occurred in June of 1947, which is the same month as Kenneth Arnold's famous UFO sighting, which is often credited as having launched the current UFO era. We talked about the Kenneth Arnold sighting back in episode 46, so you can go back and listen to that for more information. Interestingly, Kenneth Arnold was one of the early investigators of the Maury Island incident, and he interviewed the main witnesses involved in it, uh, the main witness being a man named Harold Dahl. Dahl was a log salvager, meaning he would find damaged trees, log them, and then sell them for money. He was based on Maury Island, which is in Puget Sound between Tacoma, Washington and Seattle, Washington, and he was the captain of a boat and helped out with the uh, Maury Island Patrol as part of the local uh, Harbor Patrol Association. Kenneth Arnold interviewed Dahl about a month after the Maury Island incident, and in his 1952 book, The Coming of the Saucers, Arnold recounts Dahl telling him, On Saturday, June 21st, 1947, in the afternoon about 2 o'clock, I was patrolling the east bay of Maury Island close into the shore. On board were two crewmen, my 15-year-old son, and his dog. As I looked up from the wheel on my boat, I noticed six very large donut-shaped aircraft. I would judge they were about 2,000 feet above the water and almost directly overhead. At first glance, I thought them to be balloons as they seemed to be stationary. But one of the six aircraft seemed to be having difficulty. Five of these strange aircraft were circling very slowly around the sixth one, which was stationary in the center of the formation. It appeared to me that the center aircraft was in some kind of trouble as it was losing altitude fairly rapidly. The other aircraft stayed at a distance of about 200 feet above the center one as if they were following the center one down. The center aircraft came to rest almost directly overhead at about 500 feet above the water. All on board our boat were watching these aircraft with a great deal of interest as they apparently had no motors, propellers, or any visible signs of propulsion. And to the best of our hearing, they made no sound. Dahl thus got a good look at the aircraft and offered a detailed description. I would say they were at least 100 feet in diameter. Each had a hole in the center approximately 25 feet in diameter. They were all a sort of shell-like gold and silver color. Their surface seemed of metal and appeared to be made of patches because when the light shone on them through the clouds, they were brilliant. Not all one brilliance, but many brilliances. All of the aircraft seemed to have large portholes, equally spaced around the outside of their donut exterior. These portholes were from 5 to 6 feet in diameter and were round. They also appeared to have a dark, circular, continuous window on the inside and bottom of their donut shape, as though they were an observation window. But the situation with the center aircraft seemed to be dire. All of us aboard the boat were afraid this center balloon was going to crash in the bay, and just a little while before it stopped lowering, we had pulled our boat over to the beach and got out with our harbor patrol camera. I took three or four photographs of these balloons. So the men were now out of the boat and taking pictures. 
The center balloon-like aircraft remained stationary at about 500 feet from the water, while the other five aircraft kept circling over it. After about five or six minutes, one of the aircraft from the circling formation left its place in the formation and lowered itself down, right next to the stationary aircraft. In fact, it appeared to touch it and stayed stationary next to the center aircraft, as if it were giving some kind of assistance for about three or four minutes. And after this act of apparent assistance between the two craft, something dramatic happened. We heard a dull thud like an underground explosion or a thud similar to a man stamping his heel on damp ground. Immediately following this sound, the center aircraft began spewing forth what seemed like thousands of newspapers from somewhere on the inside of its center. These newspapers, which turned out to be a white type of very lightweight metal, fluttered to earth, most of them lighting in the bay. It then seemed to rain down on us in the bay and over the beach, a black or darker type metal, which looked similar to lava rock. We did not know if this metal was coming from the aircraft, but assumed that it was, as it fell at the same time that the white type metal was falling. However, since these fragments were of a darker color, we did not observe them until they started hitting the beach in the bay. All of these latter fragments seemed hot, almost molten. When they hit the bay, steam rose from the water. Needless to say, Dahl and his party tried to get out of the way. We ran for the shelter, under a cliff, on the beach, and behind logs to protect ourselves from the falling debris. In spite of our precautions, my son's arm was injured by one of the falling fragments, and our dog was hit and killed. We buried the dog at sea on a return trip to Tacoma. After this rain of metal seemed over, all of these strange aircraft lifted slowly and drifted out to the westward, which is out to sea. They rose and disappeared at a tremendous height. The center aircraft, which had spewed the debris, did not seem to be hindered in its flight, and still remained in the center of the formation, as they all rose and disappeared out to sea. And before heading back to Tacoma, Dahl and his party collected some of the debris that had dropped from the UFO. We tried to pick up several pieces of the metal or fragments and found them very hot. In fact, I almost burned my fingers. But after some of them had cooled, we loaded a considerable number of the pieces aboard the boat. We also picked up some of the metal, which had looked like falling newspapers. And there was quite a lot of debris on the beach. In fact, Dahl later estimated that as much as 20 tons of it had fallen from the UFO, which is quite a large amount. Now, there's a lot more to the Maury Island incident and what happened afterwards. The story is more significant and more complex than some accounts might lead you to think, so we'll be giving you the whole story in a future episode. But for now, the important thing is that the Maury Island incident was the first one in the modern era where materials were reported to be recovered from a UFO. But it wouldn't be the last. In fact, another such incident also occurred in 1947, just a few weeks after the Maury Island case. And this one is the most famous UFO debris case of all, the Roswell crash in New Mexico. We talked about uh, Roswell back in episode 49, so you can listen to that and hear the conclusions I reached about what crashed at Roswell based on the evidence available to me. This wouldn't have been the case in the 1940s, but with all the scientific tests we have available now, we might be able to tell whether debris from a UFO was actually extraterrestrial in origin. Has any material from the Roswell crash ever surfaced? That question is disputed. In the wake of Roswell, the Army had all the wreckage collected, and they later showed material to the press that they said came from the crash. It was material from a weather balloon, and it's hotly disputed whether this material really was from the Roswell crash or not. Rumors have persisted that some Roswell witnesses kept or found additional pieces of debris that didn't get turned in. Instead, these pieces of material remained in the hands of private individuals. But in April of 1996, something interesting happened. From the high desert in the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world's time zones, all of them covered like a great warm blanket by this program, Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell. My pleasure and... The late night radio host, Art Bell, received a letter. The letter was postmarked from South Carolina, and it was dated April 10th, 1996. It was anonymously signed as being from just a friend. And it said in part, Dear Mr. Bell, I've followed your broadcast over the last year or so and have been considering whether or not to share with you and your listeners some information related to the Roswell UFO crash. 
My grandfather was a member of the retrieval team sent to the crash site just after the incident was reported. He died in 1974, but not before he had sat down with some of us and talked about the incident. I am currently serving in the military and hold a security clearance and do not wish to go public and risk losing my career in commission. Nonetheless, I would like to briefly tell you what my own grandfather told me about Roswell. In fact, I enclose for your safekeeping samples that were in the possession of my grandfather until he died, in which I have had since his own estate was settled. As I understand it, they came from the UFO debris and were among a large batch subsequently sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio from New Mexico. My grandfather was able to appropriate them and stated that the metallic samples are pure extract aluminum. You will note that they appear old and tempered, and they have been placed in tissue paper and in baggies for posterity. I have had them since 1974, and after considerable thought and reflection, I give them to you. Feel free to share them with any of your friends in the UFO research community. And the letter did indeed contain some metallic fragments. They were contained in a box that accompanied the letter. The letter went on to describe other things, including information from his grandfather about what led to the Roswell saucer crashing in the first place. And between April and July of 1996, Art Bell and his investigative reporter, Linda Moulton Howe, went on to receive four more letters from the same individual. Linda Howe also spoke to him on the phone. And because the metallic samples were now in the possession of Art Bell and they were said to be parts of a flying saucer, they came to be playfully known as Art's Parts. And what did Art do with his parts? Well, one thing he did was report them to his radio audience, and the audience's response was skeptical. People were immediately suspicious that the anonymous friend was playing Art and that this was all a hoax. In the second letter he sent, the anonymous friend responded to this by saying... I must say that I was somewhat surprised by the negative and closed-minded responses directed your way by some of your own listeners. But the friend had invited Art to share the parts with any of his associates in the UFO research community, and Art also sent them to a researcher for testing. The researcher reported that the parts were indeed made of more than 99% pure aluminum, and the friend's grandfather had said they were pure extract aluminum, so... That much of the story seemed confirmed. Then, on May 28th, Art received a third letter from the anonymous friend, and this letter said, I have listened with interest to the in ongoing reports on the samples I sent your way. I noted that the researcher discussing the testing of the samples noted that basically it is merely aluminum. Slight variations on the testing, but indistinguishable from normal aluminum. Actually, this is precisely the same initial findings of Grandad's team. However, I neglected to include metallic samples of the exterior of the crashed Roswell disc. I now include the enclosed and can only say that these scrapings came from the exterior underside of the disc itself. It literally was a shell-like shielding of the disc, brittle and layered almost with a prefabricated design in placing. Keep in mind, Mr. Bell, that these are the last of Grandad's samples. They have sat for years inside a closet and with his personal effects. Because of certain concerns, I will not be contacting you on this matter. Perhaps I'm a bit paranoid, but I do have a family and career to think about. I hope you understand. So now Art had a new set of parts, scrapings from the underside of the vehicle, and these would turn out to be much more interesting. They weren't simply made out of aluminum, and they've been the center of discussion to this day, as we'll be hearing. Are Art's parts the only alleged pieces of a UFO that are known to exist? No, in fact, they aren't even the first ones to come to public attention. While the Maury Island debris, unfortunately, have been lost over the years, other samples of UFO debris still exist. For example, a very similar case occurred in 1957 in Brazil. The September 14, 1957 edition of the Rio de Janeiro newspaper The Globe published a piece by their columnist, Ibrahim Sued. Uh, the article was titled, A Fragment from a Flying Disc, and it contained a letter that had been sent to the columnist. Dear Mr. Ibrahim Sued, as a faithful reader of your column and an admirer of yours, I wish to give you, as a newspaper man, a scoop concerning flying discs, if you believe that they are real, of course. I didn't believe anything said or published about them, 
but just a few days ago I was forced to change my mind. I was fishing together with various friends at a place close to the town of Ubatuba, Sao Paulo, when I sighted a flying disc. It approached the beach at unbelievable speed, and an accident, i.e. a crash into the sea, seemed imminent. At the last moment, however, when it seemed it was almost striking the waters, it made a sharp turn upward and climbed rapidly on a fantastic impulse. Astonished, we followed the spectacle with our eyes when we saw the disc explode in flames. It disintegrated into thousands of fiery fragments which fell sparkling with magnificent brightness. They looked like fireworks despite the time of the accident at noon, i.e. at midday. Most of the fragments, almost all, fell into the sea. But a number of small pieces fell close to the beach and we picked up a large amount of this material, which was light as paper. I'm enclosing a sample of it. I don't know anyone that could be trusted to whom I could send it for analysis. I never read about a flying disc being found or about fragments or parts of a disc that had been picked up, unless the finding was made by military authorities and the whole thing kept as a top secret subject. I'm certain the matter will be of great interest to the brilliant columnist and I am sending two copies of this letter to the newspaper and to your home address. This letter had been signed, but unfortunately the signature was illegible, which at least here in America wouldn't be too surprising since lots of people sign their names in highly stylized or sloppy ways that you can't really read unless you already know what the person's name is. Whether this was the custom in Brazil in the 1950s, though, I don't know. But the letter did contain three small pieces of material which a local Brazilian UFO investigator described as follows. I saw the sample sent by the unidentified correspondent, three small pieces of a dull gray solid substance that appeared to be a metal of some sort. Their surfaces were not smooth and polished, but quite irregular and apparently strongly oxidized. The surface of one of the samples was shot through with almost microscopic cracks. The surfaces of all samples were covered in scattered areas with a whitish material. These whitish smears of a powdered substance appeared as a thin layer. The fine dry powder was adherent but could be displaced easily with the fingernail. Mr. Sued said the material appeared to be lead at first sight because of the gray color, but I could see that it could not be lead. The material was light, almost as light as paper. Because the debris was reportedly taken from a UFO that exploded near the coastal city of Ubatuba, Brazil, they're sometimes called the Ubatuba fragments or the Ubatuba materials, but they often go by another name because of what the laboratory analysis showed when they were checked. Basically, the fragments were made up largely of element 12, or magnesium, and as you can tell by its low atomic number, element 12 is a lightweight metal. It's even lighter than aluminum, which is element 13, which explains why the people perceived the fragments as looking like metal, but feeling almost as light as paper. As a result, the fragments are also often referred to as the Brazil magnesium. We've looked at three cases where material was said to be recovered from UFOs, Maury Island, Roswell, and Ubatuba. Are these the only cases of this type? No, there have been many others. In fact, cases of this type fit into a larger category, which are often called UFO trace cases, because the UFO leaves physical traces of itself where it appeared. Debris that's been left behind, obviously, would represent physical traces. And trace cases overlap significantly with close encounters of the second kind, which astronomer J. Allen Hynek defined as situations in which people get a close-up look at a UFO and it interacts with its environment in some way, and leaving traces or debris behind would certainly count. If the three cases we've covered are part of a larger class, why did you want to look at these in particular? I wanted to cover Maury Island because it's a case where we have a vivid account of what happened from an eyewitness of how the material came from the UFO, something we don't have in the other two cases. Nobody saw the Roswell crash itself happen, and the account of the Ubatuba UFO exploding doesn't have a great deal of detail. But I wanted to cover Roswell and Ubatuba because in 2017, the New York Times began reporting on the Defense Department's ATIP UFO program. This was the game-changing article that brought the UFO subject out into the light and caused a whole bunch of people around the world who had previously dismissed it to start taking it seriously. 
The article famously revealed that the Navy had gun camera footage of UFOs that seemed to defy explanation, but it also said something else that's directly relevant to our subject today. Referring to Nevada businessman Robert Bigelow, the article described how the ATIP program used some of its funding and said... The funding went to Mr. Bigelow's company, Bigelow Aerospace, which hired subcontractors and solicited research for the program. Under Mr. Bigelow's direction, the company modified buildings in Las Vegas for the storage of metal alloys and other materials that Mr. Elizondo and program contractors said had been recovered from unidentified aerial phenomena. We're sort of in the position of what would happen if you gave Leonardo da Vinci a garage door opener, said Harold E. Putoff, an engineer who has conducted research on extrasensory perception for the CIA and who later worked as a contractor for the program. First of all, he'd try to figure out what is this plastic stuff. He wouldn't know anything about the electromagnetic signals involved or its function. Listeners will remember Robert Bigelow as the former owner of Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, which we discussed back in episode 36. They'll also remember Hal Putoff, who with Ingo Swan developed remote viewing. That's a subject we discussed back in episodes 102 and 103. So both Robert Bigelow and Hal Putoff are familiar names for regular listeners of the show. But the important thing for us today is that the Times piece indicated that the government UFO program had metal alloys and other materials that had been collected from UFOs, or at least supposedly had been, and these were being housed at Bigelow Aerospace. And Putoff compared our efforts to figure them out to giving Leonardo da Vinci a modern device like a garage door opener. That suggested that we hadn't been able to figure out these materials, and that would suggest that they had an exotic origin. In the years since the 2017 Times article, more information has emerged about the materials being studied, and they include material that both came from arts parts and from Ubatuba. And today, we'll be telling you what's currently known about them. Excellent. And before we get to our theories and faith and reason perspectives, I want to stop and take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Timothy B., Alexander V., Amanda F., Callie P. and Ryan B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Jimmy, what theories are there about the reported UFO materials that are being studied? Uh, There are two basic theories, uh, that they're of purely normal terrestrial origin and that they're of exotic, possibly extraterrestrial origin. Those are the two basic possibilities that we need to look at. What can we say about the debris from the faith perspective? Would it have significance for the faith if they turned out to be extraterrestrial? Not really. Uh, The Christian faith doesn't exclude the possibility that God created life elsewhere in the universe, even intelligent life. So if it turned out that these materials came from craft made by aliens, that really wouldn't affect any point of the Christian faith. It would just confirm that God made other children elsewhere. We've discussed the possible existence of extraterrestrial life in many prior episodes, and if you'd like a full discussion of the religious implications of discovering intelligent alien life, you should go back and listen to episode 55 on aliens and religion. Then let's discuss the UFO debris from the reason perspective. How would you even go about determining whether it came from Earth or not? One of the ways would be looking at the atoms that the material is made of. The same basic elements are present everywhere in the universe, but they come in different isotope ratios. That's something we talked about back in episode 80 on alien implants. Let's review that concept a bit. First, what's an isotope? 
An isotope is a kind of variation on an individual element. The thing that determines what element an atom is is the number of protons that it has. For example, if an element has one proton, then it's element one, which we call hydrogen. If it has two protons, then it's element two, which we call helium, three protons, and it's element three, or lithium, and so on. But atoms have more than protons in them. They also have electrons and neutrons. So while the number of protons tells you what element you've got, the number of electrons tells you what ion of that element it is, and the number of neutrons tells you what isotope of the element it is. For example, all carbon atoms have six protons because carbon is element six. But carbon atoms can have different numbers of neutrons. Some have as few as two neutrons, but others have as many as 16 neutrons. And those differing numbers of neutrons give you different isotopes of carbon. The isotope number is based on the number of protons plus the number of neutrons that an atom has. So essentially, the particles, the number of particles in its nucleus or its nuclear particles. The lightest carbon isotope is carbon-8, which has six protons plus two neutrons for a total of eight nuclear particles, giving you carbon-8. Most of the carbon on Earth is carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons for a total of 12 nuclear particles. You may also have heard of carbon-14, which has six protons and eight neutrons. The useful thing about carbon-14 is that it's radioactive and it decays over time, so you can measure the amount of carbon-14 in an object to find out how old it is. That's done with carbon-14 testing or radiometric dating. Why would the isotopes that an object contains tell you anything about whether it was from Earth or not? Because planets are made out of materials that condensed from nebulas or interstellar gas and dust clouds, like we talked about last week in episode 206 on how we found the universe. And much of the gas and dust in those nebulas came from dying stars. When a star dies, it releases elements that had been fused together inside the nuclear furnace inside the star during its lifetime. That nuclear fusion process produces not just different elements, but also different isotopes of those elements. And those isotopes are then released out into space when the star dies. That includes the long dead star that produced the nebula that Earth and our solar system formed out of. You can use the ratio of the isotopes we have here on Earth as a fingerprint to identify the nebula that our planet formed out of. So you can find an object and if it has the right ratio of isotopes for our solar system, that suggests that it came from our solar system. But if you find an object that has a different ratio of isotopes, that can be evidence that it didn't come from our solar system. Instead, it may have come from a solar system that formed out of a different nebula. You say may have. Is the isotope test conclusive? No, it's not, because it's possible to use modern technology to change one isotope into another. As a result, if you want to do enough work in a lab, you could change the isotope ratio in an object so that it wouldn't look like it's native to our solar system. But the question is, why you would want to do that? It may be possible to do it, but it's hard and expensive. So if there's no obvious reason why someone would want to change the isotope ratios in an object, it can still count as evidence that it didn't come from here. Let's suppose that an object has normal isotope ratios, the kind we would expect from materials that came from our solar system. Would those ratios prove that it must be the product of human technology? Not at all, because interstellar travel appears to be really hard, whether it's done by faster than light means or slower than light means. It looks hard, it, like it takes a lot of energy to do. And that means that alien races would likely try to conserve energy as much as possible in interstellar travel. 
One of the best ways you could explore the galaxy is by not sending an individual ship to every star system. Instead, you could send just one ship to another solar system and have it make copies of itself. And then these copies could be sent to other nearby systems. The result would be that you only have to spend the energy to send a single ship, but you get reports back from the multiple copies it makes. Self-replicating probes are thus a really great way to explore the galaxy. What if a species discovers a system has intelligent life and they want to go there and see for themselves firsthand? What would they do in that case? They still might manufacture things locally in the new star system that they're exploring. There would still be a huge energy savings by traveling light when you're going between star systems. You take as little as possible on your way to the new star system and then you make everything you need once you get there. So you only bring blueprints and machines to help you manufacture things. And then when you arrive in the new solar system that you want to study, you collect raw materials there and make the items you need for your survey. Whether that's robots to help you do the study or biological entities to help you do the study or machines to help you do the study or vehicles to help you do the study. But if all of those things are made locally in the new solar system, then they'd be expected to have the isotope ratios that are native to that system. So if aliens came to visit us and made a bunch of stuff what the, once they got here, it would have the same isotope ratios that you would expect in our solar system. And as a result, having local isotope ratios would not prove that the material was produced by humans. Are there ways you could try to settle whether such material was made by extraterrestrials or by us? Uh, potentially, there are ways. For example, if the material you have is identical to something that humans are known to make, well, then that's strong evidence it was made by humans, as we'll see, and we'll see an example of that later in the program. On the other hand, if the material you have is very unlike things humans are known to make, then that would be evidence that the material may have a non-human origin. Humans are always manufacturing lots of new things, though. How would you know that the materials weren't just something new that people come up with? It would be very difficult to know for sure, but there are at least a few possible indicators. One of them is the manufacturing process that was used to produce the materials. If it would be ridiculously hard to make the materials and there was no apparent purpose behind undertaking such a difficult process, like why would anyone bother changing these isotope ratios around even though it's technically possible to do so, then that could be evidence it's not of human origin. Or if we simply don't know how to make the materials, that also would be even stronger evidence that someone other than us made them. The same also applies if the manufacturing techniques hadn't been developed at the time the materials are known to have existed. For example, uh, we might have the ability to make something now, but we might not have had it at the time that Art received his parts in the mail. In any event, impractical or inexplicable manufacturing techniques would be a sign that maybe we didn't make these things. What would be another indicator of non-human origin for materials? The properties that they display. If the materials are observed to do things that we don't know how to duplicate, that would be evidence that we didn't make them. For example, we have recently developed some metamaterials that allow objects to be invisible at certain frequencies of light, but we don't yet have metamaterials that allow for full invisibility. So if alleged UFO materials were found that could become fully invisible, that would be evidence we didn't make them since we don't know how to make that kind of material. And by the way, uh, using metamaterials to achieve invisibility effects is known as metamaterial cloaking. And we'll have a link to information on metamaterial cloaking so that you can learn more about it and how it works and what's been achieved so far. Well, you've been using this term that a lot of people may not be familiar with. So uh, can you give a description now of what a mater metamaterial is? The Greek word meta means beyond. So metamaterials are materials that display abilities beyond those of natural materials. Wikipedia gives a basic explanation. 
A metamaterial is any material engineered to have a property that is not found in not naturally occurring materials. They are made from assemblies of multiple elements fashioned from composite materials such as metals and plastics. The materials are usually arranged in repeating patterns at scales that are smaller than the wavelengths of the phenomena they influence. Metamaterials derive their properties not from the properties of the base materials, but from their newly designed structures. Their precise shape, geometry, size, orientation, and arrangement gives them their smart properties capable of manipulating electromagnetic waves by blocking, absorbing, enhancing, or bending waves to achieve benefits that go beyond what is possible with conventional materials. Research on metamaterials actually goes back to the late 19th century, but it's only hit kicking into high gear right now in the early 21st. And metamaterials are expected to unlock a bunch of new abilities, like practical invisibility shields in the future. So if you've got UFO crash debris that display properties of a metamaterial that we don't know how to produce yet, that would be evidence that maybe we didn't produce it. How would you know that it wasn't just part of some advanced, highly classified project? You wouldn't know that for sure, at least if you don't have access to the world of advanced, highly classified technology. But that's a problem we always face when looking at this question. I mean, suppose we were living 2000 years ago in the first century in the Roman Empire, and suppose that someone found a modern iPhone with enough battery charge that you could still use it to do things like take pictures and play games and music. Nobody would have any idea how it worked. But you could always propose that there was some remote genius living on an island somewhere who built it, even though it was way beyond the technology of the day. Like maybe the Greek inventor Archimedes, who apparently invented a heat ray. In the same way, and yes, we will be talking about that in the future. In the same way, no matter what you find today, you can always propose some top secret black budget project to explain it. But regardless of what century you're living in, if something goes beyond the standard technology of the day, it's significant. There's never a 100% guarantee that it hasn't been made by some genius human inventor, but the farther outside of known technology is, the less likely that is to be the case. Before we look at these specific UFO crash materials that have been reported, let me ask a general question. If UFOs are really advanced alien technology, why would they crash or malfunction so much? It seems like we have an awful lot of crashes and malfunctions reported for supposedly advanced technology. I agree. It does seem like there are way too many crashes and malfunctions being reported in the UFO literature. I wouldn't expect anything like the claimed number of crashes from technologically advanced beings capable of flinging themselves between the stars. However, bear in mind that the craft people typically see in UFO encounters are small. They're not huge, like what you might expect an interstellar ship with a big interstellar drive of whatever kind to be like. They're more like the size of an airplane or a blimp, which suggests that they're meant for local use and local maneuvering on the way on and around Earth. And that means they might not be built to the same standard as an interstellar craft. They may well be less sturdy than something capable of traveling between the stars. So, I'm that's a possibility, but I'm still suspicious about the number of crashes that have been reported. Do you know of any things that could explain there being multiple crashes? I'm aware of explanations that could be offered. For example, there are claims that our own technology, like radar systems, interfere with the tech and cause them to crash or malfunction. And that's possible because technologies that aren't designed to work together can cause problems. It's also possible that they just aren't as far ahead of us as we imagine. I mean, maybe they can just barely get here slower than light, and they're still using unreliable, newly developed technology that they haven't perfected yet. Or if they're aliens, maybe they just don't have the same values that we do when it comes to safe and reliable technology. Maybe they're super risk takers who get a thrill from using dangerous technology, the way some humans get a thrill from going up in primitive vintage airplanes and then jumping out of them. 
or maybe they're collectivists who don't care about the lives of individual members of their own species, so they don't design for safety. Or maybe there aren't any members of their own species on the UFOs, just drones or robots or biological robots that they don't really care about because they can make a bazillion more of them as needed. There are loads of possible explanations, but I do find it suspicious how many crashes and malfunctions are reported in the UFO literature. How many of the crash reports do you think are accurate? I'm sure that the great majority of them are not accurate, just as I'm sure that the great majority of UFO reports are not actually alien spaceships. However, ultimately, you only need one. It doesn't matter if 99.99% of UFO reports have a normal explanation, and it doesn't matter if 99.99% of UFO crash reports aren't accurate. All you need is one genuine report of an alien craft or one genuine report of a crashed or damaged UFO, and that changes everything. As a result, however unlikely crashes and malfunctions may be, we can't dismiss them out of hand. We have to look at the evidence and what it says about the individual reports. And if it turns out that we have materials from a UFO crash that we can't explain, then that's potentially of enormous significance. Let's turn to the specific materials the government has been studying. What do we know about the ones we've mentioned in this episode? We know they've been studying some of the Ubatuba materials and some of Art's parts, and we don't have published government reports on what has been found, but we do have some independent analyses and some public statements by people who are involved in the current studies. When it comes to the Ubatuba material, one recent analysis comes from a group known as the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, or SCU for short. In the spring-summer 2020 issue of the SCU Review, the pub uh, they published a series of highlights in which they state... Samples, said to be from Ubatuba samples, were given to a Brazilian newspaper by an anonymous individual in September of 1957. The initial test of the material at the time indicated pure magnesium based on the equipment's capability. Portions of the Ubatuba sample have been tested in over 20 labs since 1957. The current consensus is that the Ubatuba sample is 99.88% pure magnesium, with the most common trace elements being strontium, barium, copper, and zinc. SCU tested isotope ratios of the primary element, magnesium, as well as the four primary trace elements at accredited labs using National Institute of Standards and Technology traceable standards. Testing was done at two separate labs in 2017 and 2018. The magnesium isotope ratios appear to be within the expected terrestrial range. The question of whether the isotope ratios of the trace elements meets terrestrial norms is more inconclusive due to the variations between the two labs. A recommendation for any future work is to isolate the trace elements from the magnesium prior to looking at isotope ratios of the trace elements. The most unusual anomaly with the sample is how 99.88% pure magnesium with strontium and barium impurities showed up in 1957 Brazil. So the key findings are the magnesium itself falls within earthly isotope ratios, but it's less clear whether the isotope ratios of the trace elements do. One lab said that they weren't normal terrestrial ratios, while the other lab said that they were, and it's not clear which lab is right, so they recommended isolating the trace elements in the future for additional testing. Also, it's hard to explain why you'd find objects in 1957 in Brazil that are 99.88% pure magnesium with traces of strontium and barium. That's not something you'd expect to find, so that itself is significant. Thus, their findings were significant, but inconclusive. You said that there were some public statements from people connected with the government's analysis. Have any of them said anything regarding the Ubatuba magnesium? They have. One is Dr. Gary Nolan of Stanford University. He's a pathologist, but he has special testing equipment, and so he's been asked to look at the Ubatuba materials with his equipment. And here's what he had to say on Jesse Michael's American Alchemy show. Thought it was magnesium at an extremely high level of purity, but that's strange because 
magnesium burns like hell. Mm -hmm. So obviously it had something else in it. So you know, we did, uh, we did a mass spectrometry analysis of some of those pieces with a highly sensitive instrument. Um, it's over in the engineering department called a nanosims. It's a secondary ion mass spec, as it's called. And basically, what it lets you what what it lets you do is determine uh, not just the elements by their mass, but also the isotopes mm -hmm. by their mass, right? And one of them was anomalous. The magnesium ratios were way off. Mm. I mean, not even close to being natural. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Right? So you would never find this. You would never find it in nature. Yeah. You'd never find it in nature. And you'd need some sort of centrifuge or something to create that yes. isotope ratio. Would that be possible? Oh, it's possible. But it's, it's just like, expensive yeah. beyond, you know. And most people don't have access to centrifuges. Especially when these uh, things were found. And the, the more in question is, why would you do why it? Why would you do it? What's the motivation? What's the motivation for it? Is, yeah. it? is it something that they're using and they need that? ratio to accomplish something or is it a byproduct of an of, of an effect that where they take the natural things and then they're doing something mm -hmm. and this ends up being the outcome and then when they're done with it they go and they throw it out mm -hmm. right so he had different samples of magnesium reported to be from Ubatuba. One contained purely normal terrestrial isotope ratios, and the other had isotope ratios that were way off from what you'd expect if they came from our solar system. In an interview with Vice.com, Nolan said that the ratios were like 30% off from what you would expect if they came from here, which is a pretty big difference. And the fact some samples were normal and some were anomalous could partly explain why the, why the testing that's been done on the Ubatuba materials had been inconclusive. Yes, researchers may have been looking at different samples. Some pieces of the material may be absolutely normal with terrestrial isotope ratios, while other pieces of the material may have abnormal ratios that you wouldn't expect to find here. Nolan says correctly that it's possible to manufacture ratios like these, but there's no obvious reason why you would want to do that. He also acknowledges that the ratios found in the anomalous sample could have been produced as the result of something happening on board the UFO, like maybe they were being used in an atomic process on the ship, and once the process went wrong or their use had been exhausted, they had to be spit out, like the malfunctioning ship at Maury Island was reported to spit stuff out in order to fix itself. Nolan also revealed that he still has some pieces of the samples in a safety deposit box, and he invited Jesse Michaels to come back and take a look at them. Very excitingly, we, we have parts uh, of possible UFO crashes. So w what's the background on what we're looking at now? Okay, the parts were a little anticlimactic and small, but he claims to have much bigger parts that we can't see due to national security sensitivities. And we now know that isotope ratios might have more to do with the properties of the material right. themselves and the features and what the material can actually do in the physical world than we right. had previously thought, right? Right. Correct. The odd thing was that the other piece, which supposedly came from the same event, had exactly the correct isotope ratios as to what you would find on Earth. The material up front was what we would say inhomogeneous or partially mixed. It's kind of like if you were to take chocolate ice cream and vanilla ice cream and then just do a bit, little bit of a swirl, you would see a mixture and we would call that inhomogeneous. Why would you mix some of these elements? Yeah. There's actually, again, no good reason. There's no metal that people normally make that have some of the mixtures that we've seen. So it's unclear why you'd have normal isotopes mixed with unusual ones in this way. Though, as Jesse points out, this could have to do with the properties that the isotopes have. If this was an engineered metamaterial, it could be that the properties that the unusual isotopes have allow you to do something different technologically. Like how the most common isotope of uranium, uranium-238, here on Earth, isn't good for a lot. But if you can turn that 
238 into uranium 235, you can make a nuclear bomb, change the isotope, and new technological possibilities open up. And maybe that's why you'd want to have a weird mix of different isotopes in a metamaterial. But that brings us back to the question of why someone would want to make this weird magnesium and drop it on a beach in Brazil in 1957. Nolan commented on this in an interview with Lex Friedman. So what do humans use isotopes for? Mostly to blow stuff up. I mean, the, the vast majority of the isotopes that have been made in the, in the per pound or ton are things like certain ratios of plutonium and uranium to blow stuff up. We don't make or engineer isotopes, which it's, it's, today is relatively easy to do, but it's still expensive for any other reason apart from, let's say, uh, as uh, anti-cancer. Um, we use stable isotopes in money these days as a counterfeiting tool. You basically embed certain ratios of isotopes in to make it harder for counterfeiters to accomplish. Um, and so, but other than that, we don't do anything with that. So why would you make grams of such material in this one case and drop it around on a beach in Brazil? So there doesn't seem to be a reason in terms of known human technology to make these weird isotopes of magnesium or an explanation for why they'd end up on a Brazilian beach. Further, it would have been extremely expensive to do that, especially back in 1957. The amount that I had would have cost several tens of thousands of dollars to make. Um, and again, it's not something you would just throw around and, and why would you do it in the hope that some guy 30 years from then would, would pick it up and study it. Yeah, it's a very subtle, it's, subtle yeah, troll. It's a long-term plan. <laughs> um, so, so I, I just don't know, I just don't know what to make of it, except yeah. it's interesting. So there's no apparent reason to hoax this. I mean, why spend tens of thousands of 1957 dollars before all the inflation that the government has caused in order to do a UFO hoax when the weird isotopes you spend all that money on likely wouldn't even be detected, you know, maybe not for 30 years. This isn't conclusive, but it's very interesting. That covers the Uba Tuba materials, but what about arts parts? What's been discovered about them? You'll recall that Arts Parts came in two batches. The first was from the, when the anonymous donor provided a box of small parts that were almost pure aluminum. And then later, he sent additional samples that were said to be scrapings taken from the underside of the Roswell disk. Since these are different materials, we need to look at them separately. When it comes to the aluminum pieces, Art Bell had tests run on them, and they did confirm that they were like 99% pure aluminum, which went along with what the sender's grandfather had said. Have there been more recent scientific studies that have, been, that have confirmed that? Not so far as I'm aware, but there has been some online discussion of them, and we ought to take a look at it. In the first place, there have been pictures of the aluminum parts that were sent, and we'll be showing you these pictures in the video version of the podcast that you can watch at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. We'll also have links in the show notes to where you can view them online. First, there's an overall picture of the parts together resting on the back of a manila envelope. There's also a standard U.S. quarter coin in the phrase to provide scale. And for your reference, a quarter is just under an inch or 2.5 centimeters in diameter. At the top of the frame is a long strip of metal that is bending with the envelope. The metal strip is 10 inches long and one and a half inches wide, and it's only a sixth of a millimeter thick. So it's very thin. Below the long shiny strip is a collection of a few dozen small items bunched up together. The analyst that Art sent some of these objects to referred to them as chips because they look kind of like computer chips, even though they're not computer chips because they're made out of aluminum and they don't have printed circuits on them. Most of them are gray metallic squares, though a few are ovals and a couple are circles, and they look like they've been punched out of a metal sheet. 
These items are smaller than the quarter. The squares are about six millimeters or a quarter inch on each side, and the ovals and circles are similarly sized. There's also a shiny disc in the image, and the disc is about twice the size or diameter of the quarter, so it's approximately two inches or five centimeters across. And it has circular grooves in its surface, like tree rings or the grooves on a vinyl record, except these grooves go all the way to the center. Finally, there are three sheets of shiny flat metal. Each of these is a rectangle that's about two inches across and two and a half inches long, or five by six centimeters. What's interesting when you look at these flat sheets is that they have a kind of grid pattern on them. The grid has six rows and four columns, meaning each sheet is divided into 24 cells. Each cell is also subdivided with multiple vertical slits. Inside of each of the 24 cells are 10 parallel slits that are a millimeter apart, and the slits are louvered or tilted at an angle, like the slits on a heating vent. In fact, if you uh, look at a household heating or air conditioning vent, the slits in one group tilt in the opposite direction from the slits in the other, and you see the same pattern or same kind of pattern in th these three metal sheets that Art was sent. What's been discovered about the aluminum parts that Art receives? Other than they're almost pure aluminum with a few trace elements, I'm not aware of anything. At least I'm not aware of anything that would suggest they're the product of an exotic technology. In fact, one of the four types of parts seems to be a very ordinary sort of technology. Now, Art received a long metal strip, a metal disc, a bunch of metal chips, and three metal sheets that had louvered slits cut in them, like those you'd find on a heating vent. Well, the skeptical website metabunk.org thinks that they may have identified where the metal sheets came from. They did some searching and asking around online, and they discovered that the sheets Art had look very similar to the louvered sheets used in an automobile radiator. Specifically, they look like a flattened out version of what's known as a serpentine cooling fin. This type of cooling fin has the same general type of louvered slits, only the sheet is normally folded up into a kind of zigzag or S pattern. There's a company known as DeWitts who advertise themselves as makers of high performance aluminum radiators. On their website, they provide a picture of what a serpentine cooling fin looks like, and they explain what a serpentine cooling fin is. Automotive radiators use a thin foil material rolled, formed into a corrugated pattern to transfer heat from the cooling tubes to the air. During the roll forming process, small windows or louvers are stamped into the foil. The louvers are formed in a group on one half of the material and then a mirror opposite on the other. As air passes through the radiator core, the louvers deflect the airflow in an S-type or snake pattern. As a result, the term serpentine was adopted. Louver pattern, angle, and width can all have a specific effect on heat transfer. The picture on the DeWitt's website already looks similar, very similar, to the sheets that Art received, though the patterns of the slits isn't exactly the same. However, the folks at Metabunk found an image of a louvered fin with a slit pattern even more similar to the one in Art's parts. They say that this kind of sheeting was invented in 1925, and they provide a comparison image so that you can see how similar it is to the slitted sheet that Art received. The slit pattern isn't identical, but it is very close. Also, the sheets are made of aluminum, the same thing uh, companies like DeWitt's make serpentine cooling fins out of. So it looks like the slitted sheets that Art received are likely serpentine cooling fins, uh, cooling fin sheets from a car radiator. They've either been flattened out or they were never bent into the final zigzag S pattern. What would that say about the origin of Art's parts? 
it looks like we've got a plausible earthly origin for the aluminum sheets Art was sent, and that makes it likely that the other aluminum parts, the strip, disc, and chips, also have a terrestrial origin, especially given that there hasn't been anything weird discovered about the aluminum parts, at least so far as I know. Does that mean the person who sent Art these objects was just hoaxing him? Maybe, but maybe not. He said he found these parts in his grandfather's effects, where they'd been sitting in a closet for years, and who knows how organized his grandfather's effects were, or how they were labeled, or how they may have gotten jumbled, especially after his death. There's considerable potential for confusion here, so it's possible the sender was hoaxing, or that the grandfather was hoaxing, or that nobody was hoaxing, and these were sent by a mistake as a result of a mix-up. But it does raise suspicions. Art also received scrapings, allegedly taken from the underside of the Roswell craft. Does that mean we should set aside these additional parts and conclude that they also have a terrestrial origin? No, because the claimed items need to be looked at and evaluated separately. It could be that the sender got mixed up when he sent the aluminum parts, but got it right when he sent the others. You only need to find one exotic artifact to have an exotic artifact, no matter how many ordinary ones it's mixed in with. If, you know, if this was the first century and somebody brought you a bunch of objects that turned out to all be from the first century, except there was a 21st century iPhone mixed in with them, you'd still have a piece of exotic technology from a first century perspective. Then let's talk about the other parts. What were they like? There were two of them, and they were very different than the aluminum parts. For a start, they were irregularly shaped. Uh, they were a little more than two inches or five to six centimeters long and about an inch or two and a half to three centimeters wide. And they, if you want to, for the audio listeners, they kind of are roughly sort of the shape of Dorito chips. Uh, they look like they'd been cracked off and broken from a brittle surface, which goes along with what the anonymous sender had said. And you'll recall that he stated, I now include the enclosed and can only say that these scrapings came from the exterior underside of the disc itself. It literally was a shell-like shielding of the disc, brittle and layered, almost with a prefabricated design in placing. So maybe his grandfather decided to take samples from the brittle underside of the disc. Maybe he stuck in his pocket knife to take the scrapings and broke these off. In any event, they look much more complex than the aluminum parts. Each has a light side and a dark side, and they're thick enough that you can see that they're composed of numerous alternating layers of light and dark bands. It turns out that the layers are alternatingly made of the elements bismuth and magnesium. And some of the layers are super thin. And it's odd because we didn't know how to get these elements to stick together in this way. Physicist Hal Putoff has been one of the people involved in studying the sample. And in 2018, Putoff gave a speech in which he talked about these samples. So the question was, what about this material? So naturally, we looked in all of the national labs. We talked to metallurgists. We combed the entire uh, structure of published papers. Nowhere could we find any evidence that anybody ever made one of these. Secondly, some attempts were made to try to reproduce this material, but they couldn't get the bismuth and magnesium layers to bond. Thirdly, when we talked to people who in the materials field who should know, they said, we don't know why anybody would want to make anything like this. It's not obvious that it has any function. Well, years later, decades later, actually, finally our own science moves along. We move into an area called metamaterials. And it turns out that exactly this combination of materials at exactly those uh, dimensions turn out to be an excellent microscopic waveguide for very high frequency electromagnetic radiation, terahertz frequencies. So the wavelength is 60 microns, which is you know, pretty small size, but it turns out that because of the metamaterial aspect of uh, this uh, material, 
those bismuth layers that act as waveguides can be one twentieth the size of the wavelength. And usually when you make a waveguide, it's got to be about the size of the wavelength. So in fact, this turned out to be a material that would propagate sub-wavelength waveguide effects. Uh, why somebody wants to do that, we still don't know the answer to that. So there was no evidence anybody had made anything like this. They tried to reproduce it, but couldn't. And experts didn't know why anyone would want to make this. But decades later, our own metamaterial science discovered that this combination of materials in these sizes makes an excellent waveguide for electromagnetic radiation in the terahertz frequencies. We should stop and talk about some of that. First, what's a terahertz? Hertz is a measure of the frequency of a wave. Waves are cycles with highs and lows or peaks and troughs, like waves you see in a body of water. And you measure the frequency of a wave by asking how frequent those peaks and troughs are. So frequency is just what it sounds like, a, a measure of how frequently the peaks are going by. If a peak goes by once every second, we say the wave has a frequency of one hertz. If it comes by twice a second, we have we, we say that it has a frequency of two hertz. Ten peaks a second means a frequency of ten hertz and so on. Well, a terahertz means that one trillion peaks are passing every second. So that's a very high frequency there. Those waves are the peaks of the waves going by are very frequent. Uh, for comparison, your computer operates in the gigahertz range, range, which means that it has billions of pulses per second. But terahertz are a thousand times faster than that. So there are frequencies that are a thousand times faster than what your home computer uses. Okay, then what is a waveguide? As you'd guess, a waveguide is a structure in a material substance that guides waves and makes them go where you want. You can think of it kind of like a pipe or channel that guides waves of water where you want them to go, only it's guiding electromagnetic energy instead of water. As Hal Putoff says, the waveguide typically needs to be roughly the same size as the wave that it's trying to guide. If the waveguide is much smaller or larger, than the wave, it won't be able to guide it. Instead, it could disrupt it. But our metamaterial scientists eventually figured out that you could use properly structured layers of bismuth and magnesium to serve a, as a much more efficient kind of waveguide. In effect, the bismuth layers acting as waveguides only need to be a 20th the size of the wave that they're guiding. So they don't need to be as big as the wavelength. They can be 20 times smaller. Why would that make a difference? What could you do with a tiny waveguide like that? We're not sure, as Hal Putoff said, but Gary Nolan discusses some possibilities. What can you do with terahertz that we can't with current? Well, it's, it's just more pack in more information. Pack in more information faster, yeah. farther. Yeah. Terahertz is the next thing uh, for communication, that if we can get terahertz waves uh, working efficiently, there's a whole slew of other electronic and radio communication uh, things that can be done that can't be done now. So waveguides like this are used to pump information from one place to another, and it looks like that's part of what this metamaterial was designed to do. Maybe they had the equivalent of computer chips embedded on the outer skin of the UFO, or maybe a communication system, or maybe something else. But it looks like this is an exotic material that took decades for our own science to begin to understand. How common is it to find alleged UFO materials that have exotic properties like this? That's not clear because the government hasn't published its findings. In his speech, Hal Putoff says that he'd like to share with the audience some of the more exciting findings, but he can't because they're classified. That's why he picked one of Art's parts, because it was already publicly known and had been studied by people outside the government in, non, in a non-classified setting. Gary Nolan has only examined a small number of alleged UFO materials, but even he has found more than one. 
that was exotic. In his Vice.com interview, he was asked, how many objects have you checked out that are not playing by our rules? And he replied, So of the 10 or 12 that I've looked at, two seem to be not playing by our rules. That doesn't mean that they're levitating on my desk or anything. It just means that they have altered isotope ratios. So Nolan has found two exotic objects, and Putoff says that there are some really interesting ones that he can't talk about because they're classified. And Putoff also says that the overall pattern of what happened with the bismuth magnesium sample from Arts Parts happens with some regularity. It was amazing that we've gone through this, and this is a kind of structure we go through a lot. You get a material sample with unusual characteristics to be evaluated. The method of manufacture is difficult to assess or reproduce. The purpose of the function is not readily apparent, as with our sample here. And then as our own technical knowledge uh, moves forward, we finally see a possible purpose or function comes to light. That sequence is repeated over and over in this particular area. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line about arts parts and the UFO crash debris? I think it's fair to say that a lot of UFO crash reports, like a lot of UFO reports in general, are not accurate, uh, at least not extraterrestrial in origin. And many of the materials claimed to have come from UFOs have a purely conventional explanation, like the apparent aluminum automobile radiator fins that Art Bell was sent. However, there also are materials that display exotic properties for which there's no obvious explanation, like why someone would spend tens of thousands of dollars to make weird magnesium isotopes and drop them on a beach in Brazil in 1957, when these isotope ratios were not even likely to be discovered and when there was no known purpose for such isotopes. Then there are materials like the layered bismuth magnesium samples from Arts Parts that appear to be metamaterials. In this case, a material with a kind of super small waveguide that it took regular science decades to discover after Arts Parts were known to exist. And apparently, the government has even more interesting samples that are still classified. I can't say what's responsible for this. It's possible that some might be elaborate hoaxes. It's possible that some might be from currently classified technology belonging either to the United States or one of our competitors. Or it could be that the technology is more exotic still and comes from extraterrestrials, crypto-terrestrials, interdimensionals, time travelers, or something else. But on national security grounds, I think it's appropriate that the government is studying them because if this is exotic technology, human or otherwise, operating in the world today, we need to know about it. Jimmy, what further resources can we direct the listener and viewer to? We'll have a link to a book by Ross Coulthart uh, called In Plain Sight, which is an excellent update on a lot of what's been going on with ATIP. And uh, it has a discussion of arts parts and um, and other UFO crash stuff. We'll also have a link to Kenneth Arnold's book, The Coming of the Saucers, in which he uh, covers the Maury Island incident. We'll have the, a link to the letters that uh, were sent by the anonymous friend with Arts Parts. Also, the original uh, 2017 New York Times article that we referenced, information on metamaterials and metamaterial cloaking, uh, compositional analysis of the Brazil magnesium and events possibly related to the Brazil magnesium, the uh, publication from the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, or SCU, on the Ubatuba magnesium and their full presentation on the Ubatuba magnesium. Also, uh, Jesse Michael's American Alchemy interview with Gary Nolan, Lex Friedman's interview with Gary Nolan, Vice.com's interview with Gary Nolan, an early analysis of the aluminum arts parts and metabunk on the aluminum arts parts. Also, we'll have a link to the DeWitt's uh, website uh, where they explain what a serpentine cooling fin is, and also a link to Hal Putoff's 2018 presentation and another more recent interview by him. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? 
Well, uh, since we're talking about a kind of, kind of scientific subject, I thought I'd give us a science theme. And you know how we mentioned that isotopes have, you know, the, the element is determined by the number of protons, but then you have these isotopes and ions that are determined by electrons and neutrons. Well, that's all boring matter. What about antimatter? Well, of course, antimatter is interesting. You just flip the charges of all these things. So protons become negative and electrons become positive and neutrons actually are anti-neutrons, but their charge still stays neutral. But now let's get weird. Let's make atoms out of both matter and antimatter. Let's have hybrid matter antimatter atoms this is quite possible and we have done it um for example now you might wonder how this would work well suppose you've got an atom of element two um helium helium has two protons it typically has two neutrons and it's got two electrons so you have the positive charges of the two protons in the nucleus being balanced by the negative charges of the two electrons that are orbiting the nucleus so let's take one of those electrons get rid of it and in its place we put an antiproton because antiprotons are negative and so you still have two negative charges orbiting the positively charged nucleus and so you've got hybrid helium that is part antimatter part matter and scientists have been doing experiments with hybrid matter antimatter atoms and they've gotten them down close to uh, absolute zero and have found some interesting stuff that we didn't know before. So be sure to check out our link to information about the hybrid matter antimatter atoms that scientists have been playing with. Also, long standing mystery. Why are T-Rex arms so freaky short? <laughs> I mean, they're bizarre. If you if you put them on a human scale, it would be like a human having arms five inches long. Why would that be? Well, obviously, they weren't using them to hunt. You know, in fact, we actually think we know a good bit about how T-Rex is hunted these days. Apparently, they did it in packs and they would have uh, juveniles like teenage T-Rexes that weren't full grown yet, but were still lightweight and could run fast. They would flank, they would outflank the prey and then herd the prey towards the adults who are like huge and bulked up now to put the bite on them. That's and then terrifying. If, <laughs> no, I know, I know. Yeah, because based on their encephalization ratios, it appears T-Rexes were about as smart as chimpanzees. Oh, so wow. and we will have a future episode on T-Rexes. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> but uh, but just imagine being hunted by these things that weigh tons and can just you know, bite you in half and are as smart as chimps and hunt in packs. That would change uh, Jurassic Park completely and be yes. awesome. <laughs> yeah. In any event, they've got after they after the adults put the bite on uh, on the prey, then it's obviously time for a land piranha feeding frenzy. And so the T-Rexes uh, would start devouring the prey and they probably weren't too careful about it. And there's a new theory. That's why their arms are so short. After they, they ceased using their arms for hunting, there was no selection pressure to keep the arms big. Now the arms were a liability. And they could, in a feeding frenzy, your, your buddies in your T-Rex pack could bite them off. <laughs> and that could become fatal to you. And, you know, if it gets infected or blood loss or whatever. You don't want your arms bitten off by your friends when you're down at the feeding frenzy. And so the I, new idea is maybe that puts selection pressure on the feeding frenzies, put selection pressure on them to lose the useless arms. So they started shrinking so that they would be out of the way so their friends couldn't bite them off. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's too bad the Jurassic Park franchise is ending cuz they could need to incorporate this into a future movie, but that Oh, would be it's it's a successful IP. It'll be back after a few years. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> 
All right. Well, that will do it for us. We would love to hear your theories about Ospots, as we say here in Boston, and the other reported UFO crash materials. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, send a tweet to at mys underscore world, or you can put it in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks, as always, to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work in this episode. They do a really great job. If you have... Uh, if you have need for video uh, editing and animation work, be sure to check them out. Also, if you haven't seen the work they do, if you're one of our audio listeners, uh, take, a, take a few minutes to go by youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, which is my YouTube channel, and I'm trying to grow the channel. So while you're there, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you'll always get a, uh, a notification whenever I have a new video out, whether it's uh, a mysterious world video or one of the other videos i do excellent so jimmy what are we going to be talking about next time having talked about space this week next week we're going to be talking about time specifically whether you can pray about events that occurred in the past so you can look forward to our episode about praying backwards in time or time travel prayer excellent Folks, be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at MysteriousWorldStore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. Uh, be sure to get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt, mug, and more in our new merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>